Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, uh, this is reminded me about Isa on Unity FM 93.5 FM, the heart of the city. Okay, we have come to the second part of the show, or should I say third part of the show, the second hour of the show. And in the studio we have just about made it as well, mashallah, is uh, Brother Hamza from Aira. Brother, assalamu alaikum and jazakallah for making the effort to come all the way down, well, come up from London. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How was your journey? Alhamdulillah, it was very good. Jazakallah khair. Were you doing 200 miles an hour or something? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I left early, so I was here on time. Had something to eat, then came up. Inshallah. Okay, mashallah. Uh, brother, you know, uh, I'm going to get straight to it. You know, there's a lot of insults that have been happening recently against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, we have a number of programs. I, I feel sometimes there's a conspiracy going on at the moment. The the amount of programs that are going on in this short period of time, which is just two or three weeks. Yes. Uh, and I don't know where this is heading towards, but um, you know those people like yourselves can figure out where this is leading to and what's going to happen next. Sure. You know the end of times, the jal, mm. all this stuff. You know we can we can actually discuss that if we wanted to. Uh, we're going to be speaking about the untold story. Uh, the the documentary by Tom Holland, the ridiculous, uh, t- uh, p- uh, you know, the the program, the documentary. I just found it very ridiculous when I was watching it. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, but uh, I'm going to get straight to the point. You're here to discuss the insults uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we, you're here to defend the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. More importantly, now, what is this about? Is this about freedom of speech? That's a very good question, brother. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Before we even discuss anything, let's first discuss what is freedom of speech. Okay, according to a concise dictionary of politics, which is published by Oxford, freedom of speech is basically you can express yourself without hindrance. So you have a liberty to express yourself. Now, what is interesting with this is that. Even in the neoliberal tradition in Britain, in the West, you have John Stuart Mill, who was the 19th century thinker. And he said that people ought to express themselves without any hindrance. So essentially, the freedom of speech idea is an idea that is quite abstract, which basically means, in a way, it doesn't really exist in reality, something which I'm going to touch upon in a minute. But... The reason freedom of speech came about in the West specifically was because there was the church authority in the Middle Ages, okay? And the church authority was quite oppressive. It said, you can't think like this, and you can't act like this, and you can't almost do anything you want because we are the authority, we are the divine kind of institution that whatever we say goes, so there was obviously a conflict between the coercive arm of the state, which was the church, and the church was basically telling people how to think and how to express themselves. So there was a conflict. And what's interesting, and the brothers and sisters and friends who are listening, they have to realize that Islam doesn't have this history. Islam mm. doesn't have this history. We don't have this historical baggage. Mashallah. So from this perspective, freedom of speech emerged. And that's why you have the likes of John Stuart Mill even like Thomas Paine talking about that we should express ourselves in a society without any hindrance. However, we have to make this clear. Let's be very frank with the listeners, Mm. very frank with the brothers and sisters and friends. Although freedom of speech may sound like a great idea, Mm. does it exist practically? It doesn't exist anywhere, even in the most liberal countries like Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands... Germany, England, there is no absolute freedom of speech. There is no absolute because you see in secular law, even in England, you have restrictions to speech. For instance, you have hate speech laws, Mm. profanity speech, libel. You can't speak out of turn in a court of law. You have a whole list, an array, a myriad of laws that are in place to actually restrict our own speech. So from this perspective, you know, no one would ever say, you know what, I think there should be no restrictions at all. Well, this doesn't make sense because Mm. it could be even dangerous. Imagine you're in a crowded room and then you shout, BOM! Is that a good thing to do? That's actually quite dangerous, isn't it? And this was one of the discussions amongst the philosophers. They used to say, 
what can we restrict and what forms of speech can we restrict? Can we use degrading language? Can we hate others? Can we show hatred for others? Can we lie about other people? Can we use language that will cause damage? For instance, can you go in a crowded room and shout, BOM! No, because everyone will go crazy, it will be very dangerous, people will get hurt, etc, etc. So the point is, in a nutshell, there, re- there are restrictions to speech. And what's quite funny... Even John Stuart Mill, who has been attributed with this idea of the kind of libertarian philosophy, liberty, freedom of speech, even he said that you must at some point restrict speech, okay? Now, in the 19th century, there was this big debate between trade, between trade. it was to do with corn. And he was basically saying that if you got placards against these corn dealers, okay, if you got these placards against these corn dealers that they are inciting hatred to these people, they're inciting hatred to these people, then you should prevent them or you should make it law or you should say that these people can't use placards to incite hatred to the corn dealers. There was this big debate in the 19th century. But what John Stuart Mill was trying to say is you can and must in some instances have restrictions to freedom of speech. To have restrictions of freedom of speech. Now, the interesting debate is this. What shall we call it then? Because if freedom of speech doesn't really exist, then what shall we call it? Well, I advocate another view. And this view is that we have the ability to express ourselves, but this expression is in the context of law and society's values. Because you see this all the time. It is in the context of law and society's values. So I think this is a more coherent way of talking about expression in society or when you're going to be talking in public or to other people. That you express yourself, but in the context of law and society's values. And this is quite coherent because to always claim freedom of speech, freedom of speech, practically it doesn't exist and it's not making any sense to even claim it to be freedom from that perspective, Mm. okay? Now, let me read to you a very interesting quote. And this was from John Stuart Mill during the free trade versus protectionism, okay? It was a big debate, and I mentioned this before, where corn dealers controlled the price of corn. (laughs) And John Stuart Mill was saying that speech must be restricted. And he said, an opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor or that private property is robbery ought to be unmolested when simply circulated through the press, but may justly incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer or when handed out the same mob in the form of a placard. So essentially he's saying, if you incite hatred, then you have to stop because it's going to harm other people. And as I said, there are so many restrictions in the secular so-called free world. We have defamation laws, slander and libel. We have product defamation, obscenity and threats and lying to court. Now, the argument now is this, brother. They say that freedom of speech includes freedom to insult, mm. freedom to degrade, freedom to abuse. Now, first and foremost, let's ignore the philosophy for one minute. Let's think about this as human beings. In school... We're, many of us are parents. I have children, for example. And if my child came home and he was swearing and using vile speech and degrading mm. language and be, was being dishonorable, mm. dishonorable, I will go back to school and say, what's happened here? And if the teacher said to me, well, it's our freedom of speech, freedom of expression. <laughs> We're allowed to teach them to swear and be vile and be degrading. Now, what on earth would you think about this school? We will think this school needs to be shut down. We will write to the authorities. We will complain. It's immoral. Mm. It is uncivilized. Now use this example and take it to what's happened against our beloved Prophet ﷺ. Under the so-called smokescreen of freedom of speech to say, we disagree with it, but we're going to allow it to continue to have 10 million hits and more. So, because it's all in the name of freedom of speech, which includes freedom to insult. Now, my question is this. Is this a manifestation, a product of a good society? Subhanallah. What does it say about our society? It says that we've mm. lost our moral direction. We don't have a moral compass anymore. 
we have, for instance, a lack of understanding what a civilization should be. A civilization is not one that uses degrading and vile language and obscenities and disgusting imagery against another people. This is not what we would like to call convivencia, the coexistence of cultures, mm. as Islam had in Islamic Spain, when the Quranic values were implemented in Spain, mm. we had this convivencia. You didn't see, for example, Muslim scholars standing up and start swearing at Jesus, alayhi salam, upon whom be peace, or start saying vile things about the Christian people. This is not a way of bringing people together. So we have to really take the more high ground and say, wait a minute here. We have an amazing history of 1400 years of history of general convivencia, people living together in harmony. Yes, it hasn't been perfect, but to even claim that we should allow people to use degrading language and disgraceful imagery is anti-civilization, anti-moral norms, and it's a disgrace. Now, freedom of speech, for example, had objectives, brother, yeah? And these mm. objectives were acquisition of knowledge, Acknowledgement of truth, accounting governments and individuals, and intellectual and scientific progress. So these four general objectives in the Arabic language we say the maqasid, okay, the objectives, yeah? These were the four objectives of speech. Knowledge, truth, accountability, scientific and intellectual progress. And even John Stuart Mill, he argued that the main basic justification for freedom of speech was that truth is advanced in the competition of ideas. And this is very important. Now, listen to this, brothers and sisters, carefully. If freedom of speech was based upon, it was justified because we wanted to acquire truth, progress, account individuals and governments, and have knowledge. If that's the objectives of freedom of speech, then wouldn't you argue that so-called freedom to insult and freedom to degrade goes against the very objectives of speech itself? Hmm. I imagine the famous scientist Stephen Hawking. He explained string theory and he did it by using pornographic imagery. <laughs> Would you understand anything was about string theory? What about President Obama in his inaugural address and he started swearing or even rapping? <laughs> Would you take him seriously? Mm. Has his objective been fulfilled using kind of obscene language or immoral imagery? Mm. So this is a good example of that the so-called freedom to insult goes against the very objectives of freedom of speech in the first place. Imagine I want to account Bush or Blair. And I want to say to Bush and Blair, you have blood on your hands. You are someone who has committed injustices to millions of innocents of people, many of them Muslims. 1.2 million Iraqis have died as a result of spreading so-called liberal Western democratic values at the barrel of a gun. Mm. Okay, if I were to account him, if I did it in the following way, Blair, and I'll start swearing at his mother, I'll start showing obscene pictures about him, I'll start saying extremely vile things about his family, about him, and then I stop and walk away. Have I effectively accounted him? No, obviously not, because I have to use human language, good argumentation, couched in a certain way. To account him appropriately mm. To have a good case So therefore My illusion Of the freedom of insult And to degrade others Has gone very Has gone against The very objectives Of why I should be speaking In the first place So Even in the western tradition We must argue That this is wrong This film must be banned It's obscene It's counter civilization Counter morality it's counter values. It goes against the very humanity, the very collective conscience of us human beings. And this is why we must stand up and really defend the honor of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and really say that this is a disgrace. It shows a lot about <coughs> where Western values have turned now. Of course, definitely. Now, we're not saying all Westerners are like this. Joe Bloggs next door, he's a nice guy. He's my friend. Mm. We're talking about the elite the politic here. And the Quran makes this differentiation because in Surah Mumtahana, verse 8, Allah Azza wa Jal, He basically says, Allah does not forbid you to be kind and just hmm. to those who don't fight you and those who don't expel you from your homes. Okay? And don't fight you for your religion. 
So Allah is telling us we must be kind and just to people who are not fighting us. Mm. So this is the general masses. But the elites, the politicians, the intellectuals, they, 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 they are in an intellectual warfare here. Mm. And it shows they've lost the battle, brother. Of course. Because if you want to say something about the Prophet wasallam, write a paper, be an academic, have a thesis. We don't, we're not scared of debate and dialogue. Mm. Our ulama, our scholars in history have debated these issues until the cows have come home. Mm. We're not scared of debate and dialogue. We, we're not sensitive from that perspective. Mm. You, you have a question, we've got answers. For example, if you, you read the works of, like, of the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah or Al Ghazali, or all of the big scholars, you see that they had nuanced discussions to do with things like the problem of evil, why is the evil in the world, how can we reconcile that with God's justice and his good wise purpose. Mm. You had the issue in some aqidah doctrines of occasionalism, try to reconcile the idea that Allah does act within the world. Obviously, there's another view that there are all this kind of philosophy. The point is, we have answers, okay? So we're not afraid of debate and dialogue. But it shows they've lost the argument. And you always know someone's lost the argument intellectually is when mm. they start to be obscene and use vile imagery. Imagine, brother, me and you were having a debate, a discussion. Mm. Say, for example, it's on mm. the length of the beard, yeah? <laughs> 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 and, and you say, brother, yes. Yes, brother, you know, we must have a beard. I say, yes, I agree, but how long is it supposed to be? And we have a debate, we use evidence. And then after you say to me, you have enough and you start swearing at me. And you start, you know, being obscene and degrading. That shows that you've lost the debate. That shows that you've actually lost the debate. So how does Islam fit in? Well, look at the Islamic values, brother. Islam is so unique that it fulfills the objectives of freedom of speech, which was truth, accountability, and progress, and knowledge. Mm. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal, in the, and let the Qur'an speak for itself. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Qur'an, in Surah Baqarah, and do not mix up the truth with falsehood, nor hide the truth while you know it. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and enjoin on each other truth, wa tawasu bil haqq. Do they not examine the realms of the heaven and the earth and whatever God has created? So indicating truth and knowledge. What about accountability? Well, Islam, in Islam we have the concept of commanding the ma'aruf and forbidding the munkar. Commanding the good and forbidding the evil. For example, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, The best of all jihad is a word of haq, of truth, to a tyrant ruler. Accountability. Mm. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the third chapter, let there be among you people that command the good, enjoining what is right and forbidding the wrong. And they are the successful ones. Okay? So Allah is talking about truth and accountability. What about progress, brother? We're all for progress as well. We're forgetting that the scientific revolution in the Renaissance in mm. Europe was based upon Islamic Spain. Exactly. Now, this is why Robert Brefro, he's a historian, he says in his publication, The Making of Humanity, he says the following, For although there is not a single aspect of European growth in which the decisive influence of Islamic culture is not traceable, nowhere is it so clear and momentous as in the genesis of that power which constitutes the permanent distinctive force of the modern world and the supreme source of its victory natural science and scientific spirit mm. we have professor thomas arnold he also said that if it wasn't for islamic spain we would not have the renaissance or the scientific revolution in england rather in europe so Islam facilitated this. Mm. Even Adam Smith, he's behind your 20 pound note. We don't even see him, okay? We just spend the money quickly these days. <laughs> just take a look. Behind the queen is Adam Smith, the modern founder of capitalism, 18th mm. century. What did he say? He talked about the empire of the caliphs. He said that they created this tranquility, the necessary tranquility for people to search into the interconnecting principles of nature. Mm. So progress is Masha. an Islamic paradigm. So you see, these are the Islamic values. We want progress, justice, accountability, truth and knowledge. But it's with true morality and values. And, and listen mm. to what Allah Azza wa Jal says. And they shall enjoy honor and dignity. Mashallah. Talking about honor and dignity. The Quran says, O believers, let not people ridicule other people, nor insult one another. Mm. SubhanAllah. 
Again, Allah says, spy not and defame not others. Allah says, God does not love the public utterance of evil speech. SubhanAllah. So you see that the Islamic paradigm, we fulfill the objective of truth, knowledge, accountability and justice. But yet, we don't dishonor people. We dignify them. We don't ridicule people. We support them. We don't spy on people. We don't defame others. And we don't utter evil speech. This is how Islam wants a society. So I want people to compare. Do you want a society that basically allows people to degrade and use evil speech continuously and not fulfill the objectives of freedom of speech? Or do you want a society that fulfills the objectives of freedom of speech yet does not allow evil utterances and degrading behavior? And this is, this is what Islam is all about. This is exactly what Islam is all about. Now, the main point of this whole video, the innocence of Muslims, mm. it, it claims the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is a liar. That's his main claim. And mm. inshallah, I know we're going to go for a break. That I want to address this claim about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was actually not a liar at all. Yes. And how we could show even using Western evidences, for example, Professor Montgomery Watt, Thomas Carlyle, Dr. William Draper and others to show that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was indeed not a liar. Mm. Just to counter the claim of this ridiculous, ridiculous, obscene, obscene movie, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll be, we'll be going to that inshallah in a short while. Um, what I've got to say is, we've had a few phone calls while you've been discussing uh, the points, uh, or should I say, mentioning the points. Uh, I haven't taken the calls because we will do that inshallah after the break. Um, Inshallah. Unless you want to take one call quickly before. Yeah, let's take one call. Okay, one quick call and then we'll take the rest after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam How are you doing, Jab? How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. Yourself, brother, how are you? Alhamdulillah. You know, uh, you know Abu Jibri is from uh, Birmingham. Yeah. Yes, brother. Uh, I think you, rec- you recognize my, my voice, do you? Yes, mashallah, I do. Mashallah. <laughs> I welcome um, I welcome your guest uh, uh, on the studio, uh, Hamza. Yeah, and uh, brother Hamza, I'll, I'll tell him in our lives, yeah, that uh, he would be we would be very delighted if he would be our guest. So if he's wondering or something, you know, we could make a a nice space uh, and, and and a room for him to to spend the night, inshallah, in Birmingham. If Oh, if you like him, the atmosphere of Birmingham as well. <laughs> <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, brother, with Jannah Firdaus. Alhamdulillah, I have a lift back. Uh, I, I have a lift back, alhamdulillah. I have something to do in the morning as well. So, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, if, you, if you told me earlier, akhi, I would fulfill fulfilled your right, inshallah, I, inviting wallah, me. I wallah, you, <laughs> you know, Hamza, brother Hamza, listen. It's just, it's just to revive the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah. people, Mashallah. they should not go to the hotel instead. They That's should go true. to home. That's true. MashaAllah. Yeah. Allah bless so. you. I already, got him a, I already got him a room. So I beat you to it, but he turned it down. So. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, we need to go for a break here, inshallah. If you need to ask him anything uh, apart from this, then feel welcome after the break. But uh, MashaAllah, he's going to have a lot of points to discuss. So stay no with us, inshallah. Jazakallah okay. for your call, brother. No problem. I will call you back, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Salam alaikum. Salam. Uh, we have a Brother Hamza here from Aira who has been with us for the last half an hour. We will be, inshallah, proceeding with the uh, uh, the scheduled program, but I'm going to go straight to the text. We've had a lot of text uh, at the beginning of the show, and I wasn't able to read them, but I want to see... Wanna, wanna read this so let the brothers and sisters out there know uh, what are the comments regarding the, uh, the movie uh, Innocence of Muslims, and also what do they feel the direction of Muslims should be at this point in time. Um, firstly, it says, Assalamu alaikum. There is no doubt that these types of attacks on our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will cause anger and make Muslim stomachs turn due to his love, due to uh, his love for Allah, his messenger. But uh, the Muslims who are truthful, sincere and just, he doesn't allow himself to be overcome by emotions and respond to these attacks with a knee-jerk reaction that entails actions which Allah and His Messenger have prohibited, which I mentioned at the top of the show, actually. this Another text says, Rather like in the matters, his first and foremost patient, his foremost patient in, in, in take matters back to Quran and Sunnah in the understanding of the companions. 
That's another text. We've got another text here saying, don't know how true this is, but received a, f- received a forwarded text message which stated the cinema in America that was going to play the film of the Prophet on the 18th of September, an earthquake hit that area that caused the building to split into two pieces. The Americans are so shocked at the miracle that they don't allow full media coverage on the topic, and that's why you didn't hear about it on the news. Share this around and let people know that Allah's protecting the Prophet. Pass this message on. Allah alam how, how true this is. But, uh, you know, we need to look into that, inshallah. It says, Assalamu alaikum. When these things happen, it should make us Muslims want to go and read on how to know more about our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Find out how we can improve our way of living. He told us that we, that if we have a problem to take it back to Quran and Sunnah, we will always get slander and hate about our religion. We are in desperate need of Imams to talk to us to calm us down. As our Ummah is at a loss, may Allah guide us to do good always as we will be asked about our actions in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I've got a few coming through. What I'll do is I will proceed with the no, show, of course, of and course. then we'll have a little a break. Valid and important There's a lot of text from the brothers and sisters. It shows that the yeah. ummah, there is khair in the ummah, and we have to understand mm. that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we will not truly believe until he, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, becomes more beloved to to our own selves than our mothers and our <laughs> fathers. Okay. So it's, it's almost a point of aqidah, of our own belief, our iman, Sunnah. that we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa more than so anything, okay? Definitely. And this is very important. And some people are complaining about the reaction of the Muslims. Fine, yes, some of the reaction, especially in the Muslim world, has been inappropriate. However, we must focus on the, provo- the ones who pro- provocated the Muslims as well. That's mm. very important to focus on. Because at the end of the day, if someone said that to your mother, you know, you'd be going, you'd be emotional as well. And Definitely. this is why the non-Muslims have to understand the Islamic perspective that we love this man more than we love our own selves, Allah. our mother and our father. So if you're going to insult him without justification, if you're going to be senseless and degrading and vile, you're going to face the consequences. Mm. You'd have to face it. You think speech has no consequences? You know, the famous existential philosopher, Kierkegaard, you know what he said? He said, people demand freedom of speech hmm. because of their inability for freedom of thinking. One. That's it. Because people say, oh, it's my freedom to speak, 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 because you can't even think. Hmm. And this is why we, this whole movie should be, it should be an Iman boost because it is a milestone in our intellectual future that some aspects of the West have actually lost the argument. This is how they are trying to argue against our tradition doing the most ridiculous, stupid, vile, degrading film rather than articulating something professionally and Mm. academically and intellectually. And this leads me to say Mm. that the Muslims have never been scared of debate and dialogue. Allah says in chapter 16, verse 125, إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ Invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction and argue with them in a way that is best. So Allah is saying, let's have a discussion. And you can see this in Islamic history, brother. Throughout medieval mm. period, the medieval period, intellectual debates were the norm. For instance, there was a big debate about the practical application of astrology. And this was a big philosophical debate by Muslim scholars and scientists at the time. What about in the 8th century? A group of people labeled as the Dahriya. Now the Dahriya are like atheists of that time, okay? And we know the famous jurist and founder of the Hanafi school of thought, Abu Hanifa, he is recorded to have refuted the Dahris in public discussions. You know, the atheists of the time, the naturalists of the time. So debate and dialogue is part of our tradition. But vile behavior and and expression and and degrading and dishonoring and and obscenities is not part of the Islamic tradition. It's probably part of their tradition. Well, exa- well <laughs> this is it. When you, have, when you teach a society, you can do what you want. Exactly. You can do what you want. If you, well, look at the... It's very individualistic society. Even if you see on the advertisements, you know, the L'Oreal, because mm. I'm worth it. It's all about me, myself and I. All this individualism. Yeah? Mm. And you even see, if you read the Children's Society report that was published in 2009 in February, they be, it's, and it's a non-Muslim 
organization, the Children's Society, they said that we have more broken families, relative broken family, families, more poverty, relative poverty amongst our children in the West, UK and the US, because of excessive individualism. What's in it for me? Mm. I could do what I want. I don't care about anyone else. I'm yeah? free. I'm free. Exactly. When in reality... No. They're slaves because they're slaves to their desires yeah. or they're slaves to what it's society wants from them. This is why Ibn Qayyum, rahimullah, what did he say? He said the true liberated human being is the one who removes the shackles to his desires, removes the shackles to society and enslaves himself to Allah. Allah because Allah knows us better than we know our own selves. Isn't it? Of course, and this is this this is the re- the existential reality of the human being in the West. They think they're free, but they're not, my brother. Because let me ask you a question: When they were born, did they choose their parents? Did they choose the eye color? Did they choose their gender? Did they choose their ethnicity? They had no choice. Mm. This is why an American writer once wrote: "Being born is like being kidnapped and sold into slavery, because you're always going to be in a state <laughs> of slavery." And Allah is saying to us. Choose your slavery. Are you going to be a slave to these slave masters? Mm. Yourself, your desires, social pressure, the system, your boss, other people. You have like a hundred slave masters you're a slave to. Mm. Allah is saying, I'm your Rabb. I'm your master. Mm. So therefore worship me and slave yourself to me. And by doing so, you'll be truly free. Allah. SubhanAllah. But that's a, that's a side note. Uh, I just quickly want to mention I've got a lot of calls coming through and we're not going to take any calls until Brother Hamza has finished what he needs to say so please be patient yeah two more minutes we'll take the calls on this okay, section okay so inshallah. anybody calling through please be patient we will take your calls when, when Hamza has finished inshallah yes now let's, let's address the main point of the film which was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was a liar now this is ridiculous because we know the claim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was I am the messenger of Allah now that was his claim. How can we assess this claim? Well, we have four options, my dear brother. Number one, he was lying. Number two, he was deluded. Number three, he was both lying and deluded. Or number four, he was speaking the truth. And we could use our reason and common sense to show that the Prophet ﷺ was indeed speaking the truth. First and foremost, his whole life, read the whole seerah. Read the life of the Prophet ﷺ. His psychological profile is not that of a liar because he sacrificed everything just for la ilaha illallah he tied two stones to his stomach because he was so hungry he saw his companions pass away and get tortured he was boycotted from his beloved city he was so brave in the battle of Hunain what did he do when the arrows were coming when he was defending Muslims and non-Muslims of the Medinan state what was he doing in the battle of Hunain he was charging to the thousands of arrows where the Sahaba retreated because it was like almost suicide for them. And he raised his sword and he said, I am not a liar, I am the messenger of Allah. Allah Subhanallah. Allah. Such bravery. Is that the psychological profile of a liar? What about his teachings? Hmm. Even his enemies called him the trustworthy. Allah so in Very a nutshell, true. to claim he's a liar is like claiming no one has ever spoken the truth. This is why the late Emeritus Professor in Arabic and Islamic Studies, W. Montgomery Watt, in his book, <coughs> Muhammad at Mecca, he explores this. And this is what he says. He says, his readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement, all argue his fundamental integrity. Now listen to how he concludes. Mm. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So we know he can't be a liar. What about maybe these people say he was deluded, which means he was crazy. Well, this is false as well, because look at his teachings. Are they a product of a deluded man? For example, he said, there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. There is a hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if you remove kindness and compassion from something, it degrades it. And if you put kindness and compassion in something, it elevates it. The no. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه You will not truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. Hmm. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke against injustice and oppression. He said, اتقوا ظلمة فإن ظلمة ظلمات يوم القيامة be conscious 
on the of oppression and injustice for it's going to be darkness on the day of judgment the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that true richness is not having wealth it's richness of the soul hmm. the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al mu'minu miratul mu'min the believer is a mirror of another believer where collective conscious we elevate each other the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if you don't show mercy to creatures to creation you will not be shown mercy by the one above in the heavens i could go on and on and on about the amazing teachings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but also we know that a deluded person uses experiences in his life to support his delusion but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had many opportunities to do that but never did that for example we know his son passed away and when his son passed away what happened there was an eclipse and the people thought that Allah made the eclipse happen because of the passing of the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, if Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was deluded, thinking that oh my god he's something special, when in reality he wasn't, he would have used that reality to support him. But he didn't. What did he say? Allah doesn't make no eclipse for no for the death of nobody. Even the the son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah. So we see that he couldn't have been deluded in any shape or form. Even if you look at the economic theory of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it transcends capitalism and communism. It transcends fourteen hundred years of trial and error. It's actually a workable model which deals with distribution, distributive wealth. For example, take one prophetic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I believe this is in Tirmidhi. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the son of Adam, all he needs is food, shelter, and clothing. Now this creates an amazing geopolitical model that you focus on the essential limited needs of the human being. And according to the Food Agricultural Organization it says there is enough food on this planet to feed three planets. But capitalism says there's too many needs not enough resources which is a lie, but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke the truth 1400 years ago. This is why Thomas Carlyle in his book on heroes and hero worship he said the man's words were not false listen to this western tradition is saying this the man's words were not false nor his workings here below a fiery mass of life cast up from the great bosom of nature itself to kindle the world the world's maker had ordered it so this is referring to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we know he can't be deluded can he be both but well, this is a contradiction you can't be lying and deluded at the same time therefore He was speaking the truth. So in 4 minutes we can articulate in a nice way without using degrading language in an intellectual way that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was indeed speaking the truth. This is why brothers and sisters and friends Dr. William Draper in his book History of Intellectual Development of Europe said 4 years after the death of Justinian in AD 569 was born in Mecca in Arabia the man who of all men had exercised the greatest influence upon the human race to be the religious head of many empires to guide the daily life of one third of the human race may perhaps justify the title of a messenger of god mm. so we know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam couldn't Sounds have been a liar now before we get some calls i just want to raise two quick issues the first issue is we must be political from this perspective because there is a political agenda this has nothing to do with freedom of speech take the hijab and the niqab ban in france freedom of expression has been curtailed in france what about morris sinet he was a cartoonist writing for a magazine okay and he wrote a biting article on sarkozy's son sinet was subsequently sacked so the media is sacking someone for using his old freedom of speech for his opinions about Sarkozy's son which is the pr- the president at the time of France what about the holocaust denial in germany you can't be someone who advocates that the holocaust didn't happen in germany now we don't we don't believe in it we don't believe in holocaust denial but if freedom of speech was so sacred to them they have to be they have to be fair for the muslims you insult and it's freedom of speech for other people it's like no you can't do this is against the law And this is why we have to understand that sometimes these things are what we will call a smoke screen. It's a smoke screen to attack Islam, it's a smoke screen to be vile and degrading, and it's a smoke screen to try and present that there are two polarized positions in the world, the West and Islam. 
But Islam doesn't really have that narrative. What Islam says, yes, there is an us and them only from a belief perspective, but we want them to become us. Do you see? We don't want to have these categories on us and them. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw the humanity as his people, and he wanted them to come to the light, not to the darkness. And this is why our reaction in the West should be one of da'wah, because the central role of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was to call people to Allah azza wa jal, to call people to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And it's very important we have this focus. rabbik, call to the way of Allah. Imagine. Imagine people did this film against Gandhi. This would never be allowed. Why? Because they know who Gandhi is. People don't know who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. Now, if we teach them about his amazing teachings, we teach them about his patience, his virtue, his morality, his character. He was a walking Quran. We teach him about his bravery. We teach him about his statesmanship. We teach him about that he. We teach them about that he was a rahma, a mercy to mankind, as Allah Azawajal says in the Quran. If we teach people this, do you think they'll be vile and degrading against him? So it's time we taught people. This is how we should empower each other. Yes, protest, be angry, be upset, but use those energies for Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If he was alive today, what would he be doing? If if he had no Islamic state, there's no Islamic state exists today. If he was alive in our situation of relative weak political position, what would he have done? Read the Sirah, people. He would have called people to La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. He would have called the entire humanity back to the fitrah, back to the innate disposition. So it's very important we start engaging in the da'wah. This is why I era we have a global campaign which is going to be starting soon. It's going to be starting on the sixth of October. It's called Inshallah. "Don't Shoot the Messenger." We're going to say test the message, and we have a website that's coming up called. TestTheMessage.com, and we're going to be showing how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not a liar, was not deluded, Allah was Allah. not a liar or deluded, but he was speaking the truth, using the rubbish that we've seen on the YouTube, and empowering ourselves mm. to call people to what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to call people to, which is the oneness of Allah azza wa jalla. So it's very important amin, amin. we do this, brothers and sisters. So Inshallah. this is this is my. Ten pence worth concerning the film and freedom of speech. So I think we should take some calls, inshallah. To inshallah, uh, if if there's anyone who who is called in and I didn't pick the phone, then you're most welcome to ring in. But I'm going to be reading. Oh, someone that was quick. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. But your your your, your voice is very very low. What you? Sorry. Yes, you're okay now. Go on, go ahead, brother. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the reason I was very quick, uh, Abu Isa, is because my heart, my heart is inside there. You know, I could, I could imagine you behind the, uh, you know, be, behind the chair and, uh, and your <laughs> guest, you know, facing you, mashallah. And uh, so passionate, you know, uh, brother Hamza. Mashallah, very uh, passionate. He, because he's, my, he's my, he, I, actually he don't know that he don't know that his student now is talking to him. You know. Hamza, do you know that I'm your student? Stuff, I don't have any students here, Chef. Yeah, you do. No, yeah, no, no. Yeah. I just give Nasiha <laughs> to myself and others. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. The, the reason why I'm saying you, the reason why I'm saying you, I'm your student, yeah, is because I really, mashallah, you know, uh, appreciate, you know, when we came down into the Olympic uh, village for the Dawah Saturday, and, uh, and and subhanallah, I was thinking to give you the message as, as just a nasiha and a reminder for you and those brothers of Ayira, Barakallahu Fikum, like uh, Abraham Green and, uh, and, and uh, the, the, all the brothers and the crews, yeah? Inshallah. That to create a similar thing and, and, and let, you know, you know, let, 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 let this uh, non-Muslims, you know, know about Muhammad. So because this is a great opportunity. Uh, this is an uh, action-reaction in a positive way, Inshallah. It shouldn't be, you know, uh, uh, like you said, you know, uh, going and Destroying, you know, properties and, and private things and, and burning. You know, that's, that's not the way because Rasulullah he had the worst case of a Ba'if. And Allah SWT put an angel, you know, assigned to him to crush the Ba'if uh, people. Where he made a dua for the Kuffar at that time, not yes. Muslims in Ba'if. And he said, May Allah bring a good, pious progeny out of them. Do you know what? The greatest ulama of today and our time 
ان طائف ما شاء الله ما شاء الله ما شاء الله الحمد لله كاد بروديوس اوف ا بوزيتيف مان فالحمد لله عم امباك لاف يعني من الكوفيد ماني ثينك اند افورتشنتلي اي ثينك يو نو بيكوز بروذر ابو ابو عيسى هي نوز ذا اي هاد شو كوم مسلم ما شاء الله Inshallah, there's going to be email going soon, either tomorrow or, or, or in the next couple of days, inshallah, brother. Mashallah, very passionate call there. Uh, unfortunately, the line was pretty bad, so Alhamdulillah, I don't want to cut him off, you know, because he's very passionate. The passion um, came through, inshallah. Mashallah, he did do. Um, uh, what we're going to be doing is, uh, there's a lot of text coming through. I am really apologize for this. We've got one minute for a break to come in, so I'm going to read as much as I can and take the rest after the break, inshallah, if Brother Hamza is okay with it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, assalamu alaikum. We see Muslims protesting, fighting with police, destroying property, and other than that, all in the name of the defending the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from uh, from this film produced by a man living in America. So these Muslims want to defend Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by committing oppression and injustice. Allah has commanded us with patience and justice and forbidden us from injustice and oppression. Rather, what we see is ignorance, oppression, misguidance, and deviation from the Sunnah of the Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Mashallah, good points. Uh, there's a lot of text. You know, I'm going to apologize. We're coming to a break. I uh, will uh, uh, come back to these texts just after the short few messages that are coming up in the next ten seconds. Brother Hamza, have a quick break. Inshallah, we're coming back in a few minutes. Inshallah. Uh, I'll see you on the side, inshallah, in a few moments. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to Reminders with me, Abu Isa, on Unity FM 93.5 FM, the heart of the city. Uh, for those who have just joined us, we have Brother Hamza Tazot Tiz with us, mashallah, from Aira. Excuse the pronunciation of your second name. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people with that problem, aren't we? Fine, we're not a problem. Yeah, is that, is that, that's your Greek name, isn't it? Yes. Mashallah, family name. Um, we were just discussing before the break about um, 
we instance of Muslims. You wanted to move on to my. I think you combined the two, didn't you? Really? Oh well, yeah, I want to talk about Tom Holland. He that, that has, crazy guy. Well, he's actually he's not rude. I mean, he could have been worse. I mean, I we ha- we have to be careful as Muslims when we look at other people because Tom Holland he could have said nasty things about Islam, but he decided to go on a different route. His own views, whether he was insincere or not, is another question. That's up to Allah to know. But we just have to basically look at his evidence and see does he have any evidence. And what Tom Holland did, he's a historian, he's a highly acclaimed author and writer, and he did a documentary a while back, just a few weeks ago, called Islam: The Untold Story. And basically, there are a few assertions and accusations in the documentary, and he basically says. That there is no early non-Muslim evidence concerning Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He did mention in the documentary Christian sources, but he never mentioned what they said. And we have plenty. And let me give you some to, for you to digest. Now there is a record of the Arab conquest of Syria written in 637 CE. That's just five years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it clearly mentions him by name. And interestingly, in this piece. It dates the Battle of Yarmouk, and it agrees with our Islamic narrative of when that battle took place. Now, this is what the record says. It says, and in January, they took the word for their lives, did the sons of Emisa, and many villages were ruined with killing by the Arabs of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and a great number of people were killed, and captives were taken from Galilee as far as Beth. And those Arabs pitched camp beside, and on the twenty-sixth of May went Sacellarius cattle from the vicinity of Emesa, and the Romans chased them. And on the tenth of August, the Romans fled from the vicinity of Damascus. There was a few gaps in this, but the historians filled the gaps from a linguistic perspective. But the point is, it mentions Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by name, and it mentions what happened after. With regards to the Battle of Yarmouk. Now, also there is another early account, and this is from Sebius. Sebius was a bishop of the house of Bagratunis. Okay, and from his chronicle, there are indications that he lived through many of the events he relates. And as for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he has the following to say. He said, at that time, a certain man from along those same sons of Ishmael. Whose name was Mahmet, which is another name for Muhammad, a merchant, and as if by God's command, appeared to them as a preacher and the path of truth. He taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially because he was learnt and informed in the history of Moses. Now, because the command was from on high, at a single order, they all came together in unity of religion. So, a very early account, a seventh-century account, concerning. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, from this perspective, Tom Holland has rejected mainstream history. Why has he rejected the chronicles and the accounts of the Christians when they're talking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So, his claim that there is no evidence of Muhammad and non-Muslim sources is not a valid claim. Also, which is quite interesting. The whole revisionist movement. Now, what is the revisionist movement? The revisionist movement amongst Orientalists is that they try to look for an alternative theory or an explanation for Islam and the appearance of Islam. Okay, and Tom Holland is adopting a revisionist standpoint, and the reason he adopts this is because they unjustifiably. Reject the whole of the Islamic narrative, Islamic history. They just reject it. A hadith, sirah, mm. even our inscriptions. We have papyri. We have so many things that substantiate our narrative. But he's rejected this. But why? Unjustifiably, he needs to justify why he's rejected this. And it goes against mainstream academic historians. For example, Michael Cook. He's a historian specializing in early Islamic history. He explains the implications of the early non-Muslim accounts of the origins of Islam. For example, he says, 
What does this material tell us? We may begin with the major points on which it agrees with Islamic tradition. It precludes any doubt as to whether Muhammad was a real person. He is named in a Syriac source that is likely to date from the time of the conquests. And there is an account of him in a Greek source from the same period. And he continues. But basically Michael Cook is saying, there is evidence. And a lot of this evidence supports the Islamic narrative. So why do you reject the Islamic narrative? Now, this is very interesting. And this is the key point of the revisionist movement. And this is the key point of Tom Holland, which not many people have understood. Because they think, brother, that this is a historical argument. It's not. It's actually a philosophical one. It's a rational one. Why? Because Tom Holland is searching for an alternative explanation for Islam. Because, because he doesn't believe that authentic testimony is a valid source of knowledge or history. I repeat, Tom Holland, he has an assumption that authentic testimony is not a valid source of knowledge of history. And this is where the Isnad comes into play. What's the Isnad? The Isnad is the chain of narration in the Islamic sciences, in the Hadith sciences, okay? And the Isnad is actually a valid source of knowledge. This is why the academic Harold Motsky, he said, in an essay that appeared in the Journal of the Near Eastern Studies, that the prophetic traditions are important and a useful type of knowledge. And he says, while studying the, while studying the Musannaf of Abdullah al-Razzaq, I came to the conclusion that the theory champion, championed by Goldzaya, Shacht, and in the footsteps many others, myself included, which in general reject Hadith literature as a historically re- reliable source for the first century after Hijra, deprives the historical study of early Islam of an important and useful type of source. So he's saying we shouldn't reject Hadith because it's an important and useful type of source of study when it comes to the history of Islam. Now, we have many, many other Orientalists and scholars and philosophers and Arabists and historians that think and believe that the Isnad system or the Ahadith literature are valid source of knowledge. However, I really want to talk about that if you reject the Isnad, the chain of narration in the sciences of Hadith, which give us a clear picture of the early accounts of Islamic history, if you reject the Isnad, you reject no knowledge like the world is round or China exists. Why? Well, take what Professor C.A. Cody said in his book, Testimony. He said, Many of us have never seen a baby born, nor have most of us examined the circulation of blood. Now, what he's trying to say is, many of the things that we believe to be haq, we believe to be true, is not based upon physical evidence, it's based upon testimony. Mm. Many of us are never going to China, but we believe China exists because of the mass testimony. This is called tawatur or mutawatur reporting in the Islamic tradition, mm. which is mass testimony. And to deny that China exists would be equivalent of advocating some kind of crazy conspiracy. Even though you've never been to China, you know China exists because of testimony. Or you know the world is round because of testimony. You haven't felt the world is round. Now you, you may claim you've seen it on pictures, but pictures are a form of testimony. So if you reject authentic testimony, like the Isnad system, you reject knowledge. This is why the Emeritus Professor of Philosophy, Keith Lehrer, he makes a, an amazing point. And I want the brothers and sisters to listen to see how strong the Isnad system is, authentic testimony is. He says, The final question that arises concerning our acceptance of testimony is this. What converts our acceptance of testimony of others into knowledge? The first part of the answer must be in our evaluations of the trustworthiness of others. And we must accept that this is so. Moreover, our trustworthiness must be successfully truth-connected. That is, the others must, in fact, be trustworthy and their trustworthiness must be truth-connected. We must accept this is so. In short, our acceptance of their testimony must be justified in a way that is not refuted or defeated by any errors that we make in evaluating them and their testimony. 
undefeated or irrefutable justified acceptance of the testimony of others is knowledge. So Keith Lehrer, professor of philosophy, saying that authenticated testimony, if we know that these people were trustworthy, that they met each other, for example, that they had good memories, if we know this, then what they say is knowledge, is truth. This is why we have Ilmur Rajal, the sciences of the biography of people in the chain of narration. We have Ilmur Hadith, the sciences of Hadith, which include the Matan, which is the text and textual criticism, and the Isnad, which is the chain of narration. So I'm basically saying that Tom Holland has no justification in rejecting the oral tradition, in rejecting, rejecting the textual tradition, in rejecting the Isnad system of Islam. Because he ignores the Islamic narrative because he said, and if you see, he quotes Patricia Crone in the documentary. And Patricia Crone, she basically says that with the oral tradition, you just remember what you want to remember. And this is why he gives it an excuse to deny the whole of the Islamic tradition or the hadith. But... They misrepresented it. It's a logical fallacy. It's a what they call a straw man in the language of logic. They're building a straw man. It's a logical fallacy. And the reason it's a logical fallacy is because they've misrepresented the Isnad system. But as we could see from Professor Cody and Professor of Philosophy Keith Lehrer, we know that testimony is a valid source of knowledge if it's authenticated. And the Isad system is not just testimony, it's authentic testimony. We see every person in the chain has a biography, which is under the category of Ilm al-Rajal, the science of the people, of men. And we see that they were trustworthy and that they were a valid source of knowledge. So I have two questions for Tom Holland. And I've actually asked him for a debate. So we could debate him under the Aira project, thebigdebates.com. But he's rejected. But I ask him two questions again. Number one. Since authenticated testimony, which forms part of the Islamic historical tradition, is a valid source of knowledge, on what grounds do you reject this valid, well-founded source of history? Second question. If you do reject authenticated testimony, are you willing to accept the philosophical and practical absurdities that follow from your unjustified skepticism. Basically, if you reject authentic testimony, then are you going to reject your own mother? Because you didn't see yourself come out of the womb. You know she's your mother because your father and your mother said so. You don't have a DNA certificate. Do you see the point? I know it's a crude example, but you reject authentic, authenticated testimony. It's like rejecting that your own mother is your mother. <laughs> So these are the two questions for Tom Holland. Now also, Tom Holland, he forgot or maybe didn't know that there is an Islamic textual tradition as well. For example, we have the Sahifa Sadiqa, which was compiled by Abdullah ibn Amr al-As during the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And his treatise is composed of 1,000 ahadith and it has remained secure and preserved. We have the Sahifa Sahiha compiled by Humam ibn Munabbah. He was from the famous students of Abu Hurairah, anhu, and he wrote all of the prophetic traditions from his teacher. And copies of these manuscripts are available from libraries in Berlin, in Germany, and Damascus, in Syria. We also have the Sahifa Bashir ibn Nahik. Ibn Nahik was the student of Abu Hurairah, anhu. And he gathered and wrote a treatise of prophetic traditions which he read to Abu Huraira before they departed and he verified it. So we even have textual tradition. If you don't agree with the oral tradition, we have physical manuscripts and he rejected them unjustifiably. Also, we have inscriptions and pap papyri as early as around 20 after Hijra. For instance, one inscription writes, and I'm, and I'm reading, one inscription writes, in the name of Allah, I... Zuhair wrote this at the time of Umar died in the year 4 and 20, which is 24 after Hijra. So this confirms the Hijra. It confirms that there was a narrative of the Prophet ﷺ and there was a Hijra. So therefore substantiating the Islamic narrative, not this Tom Holland conspiracy that Islam wasn't a religion, that it became a religion after the Arabs became powerful. Now, one interesting thing that Tom Holland tries to do he tries to go into the Qur'an 
and read the Quran as a historical document to try and show that the Quran wasn't from Mecca. It was from another place. Now, Holland argues that the Quran alludes to places, landscapes, and geography that are not descriptive of Mecca and the immediate surrounding areas. So he says, therefore, the Quran was not an Arab phenomenon. He claims that this implies that the Quran originated from a location other than Mecca or southern Arabia. And he says about the following verse And indeed, Lut alayhi salam was among the messengers. So mention when we saved him and his family, all except his wife, among those who remained with the evildoers. Then we destroyed the others. And indeed, and this is the key verse, and indeed you pass by them in the morning and at night, then will you not use your reason. Now, Tom Holland, he tries to grasp by intellectual straws. And he says that the words, you pass by them in the morning and at night, indicate a place outside Mecca. However, Tom Holland is making a daring assumption, brother. What he's saying is that he assumes that people did not travel and that the Meccans did not trade and travel to other areas. And this is the basis assumption because the Quran is addressing everybody. The Meccans who used to be traders and travelers and people used to come to Mecca to trade from surrounding Arabia. And this is why he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand this. It's a basis assumption. This is why Ira M. Lapidus, a historian, in his book, A History of Islamic Society, he clearly says that there, were, there was a lot of trading going on. So the Qur'an is addressing all people from different places in Arabia. And he says, By the mid-6th century, as here to Petra and Palmyra, Mecca became one of the important caravan site cities of the Middle East. The Meccans carried spices, leather, drugs, cloth and slaves which had come from Africa or the Far East to Syria and returned money, weapons, cereals and wine to Arabia. So basically saying there was this trade and there were traders and people used to come to Mecca and it was a hub of trading activity and therefore his argument that this is not descriptive of Mecca is not a strong argument because the Quran came for all those people in Arabia and the whole of the world. Now, Tom Holland also argues that, oh, you know, the reason I did this documentary is because there's so much more to discover in the history, the early history of Islam. Now, this is false. This is very false. Because look, Robert Hoyland, for example, a historian, he says, we do have a number of bodies of evidence, especially non-Muslim sources, papyri, inscriptions, and archaeological exca excavations. The historical memory of the Muslim community is more robust than some have claimed. Since these established academics have mentioned this, why doesn't Tom Holland look at the non-Muslim sources, the, the papyri, the inscriptions, the archaeological excavations, and why don't they... Well, why doesn't... Tom Holland, look into the robust historical memory of the Muslim community based upon Islamic tradition. So, in a nutshell, this is the refutation of uh, Islam, the untold story. Again, let me just repeat. He assumed that there was no non-Muslim evidence in the early 7th century. There is. We mentioned something with regards to a Christian chron chronicle concerning the battle of Yarmouk and mentions the name of the Prophet ﷺ. We've mentioned Sebius who was a bishop of the house of Bagratunis from his chronicle that also mentions Muhammad wasallam and that he was a messenger. We've shown that Tom Holland shouldn't have rejected the Islamic narrative because he's gone against mainstream scholarship like Michael Cook for example. We've also shown that he shouldn't have rejected the Isnad, authentic testimony. And we have the academic Harold Motsky who supports the, his, the history of the Islamic narrative, mainly the Isnad system. And also we've articulated that rejecting the Isnad, which is the whole probably the whole basis of his documentary, he rejects authentic testimony. That's why he has to have a revisionist view on early Islam. So we've explained rejecting Isnad is rejecting all types of knowledge. And mm. we mentioned Professor Cody and the philosopher Keith Leher saying if you reject authenticated testimony you're rejecting knowledge itself so we posed two questions for Holland which was why have you rejected authentic testimony on what grounds you haven't given us any grounds for that and 
if you do reject authenticate testimony, are you willing to accept the absurdities and the implications of doing so? And then we showed that there was a textual Islamic tradition. For example, the various compilations, for instance, by Abdullah ibn Amr al-As and others. And we spoke about the story of Lut, that, for example, it's a misrepresentation of the Qur'an, that it's assuming the Qur'an is only speaking to people about Mecca, and that when Allah says, in, and indeed you pass by them in the morning and at night, so it refers to a place that is not representative of Mecca, but the point mm. is, morning and night in, means that you're traveling, and it could include the traders, and we showed that the historian era M. Lapidus says that by the mid-6th century, the, the Meccans became traders, and they went all over the place. They went to Syria, they went to Africa, they went to the Far East, and people were coming from those places to Mecca as well. So it's addressing all peoples that have traveled these places. Mm. And I, I see it as a very weak argument. And also, Tom Hoyland said, look, there's so much more to discover about Islamic history, but this again is... Tom Holland says that there's so much more to discover about Islamic history, but again, this is false. As we have the historian Robert Hoyland, he said we have a number of body of evidence from non-Muslim sources, papyri, inscriptions, etc. And it, and we have the robust historical tradition of the Muslim community. So, what else do you want to discover? I mean, we have all this evidence supporting the Islamic tradition. Then investigate that. Why are you trying to look for other things that is going against mainstream, the mainstream narrative? And plus, things that you do find don't support your revisionist views. They don't support your revisionist views. So from this perspective, we have dealt with thoroughly, academically, the Tom Holland documentary, which was called Islam, the Untold Story. MashaAllah. So, so, but, you know, some people link this documentary, brother, they also link this to the whole freedom of speech, and they link it to the insults to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't know if you could make that link necessarily, but... In a way, it's all part of a campaign. Because if you think about it, people who advocate secularism mm. are going to use the media and they're going to use all the power structures in the society to defend their ideology. So documentaries like this are manifestations of that defense of secularism. So in a way, there are linked uh, the attacks on the Prophet wasallam and even the pseudo-intellectual arguments from programs such as the one done by Tom Holland. So, that's it. I think we're open for full questions. MashaAllah. I've got a lot of texts that I need to read out from uh, uh, earlier on. So, we're going to do that. If anyone wants to ring again, then Alhamdulillah, we've got a break in two minutes. So, we'll come back after the break. If there's no calls, it's been a long show. It's been going on for like, since nine o'clock. Two and a half hours so far. You know, so... Maybe some of the people have knocked off and gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Left it on to record. Anyway, I'm going to go read this text. It says, No film or cartoons will hurt our Prophet wasallam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honoured him and elevated his status. Though it hurts us, and those ignorant who make a mockery of Islam will be severely dealt with after their life respite on earth. we well, little respite on earth. We cannot sit silent at home and ignore these insults to our Prophet wasallam. I agree with the brother of Exhibition Islam about handing a simple leaflet which would disperse their myths. MashaAllah, that's a good text. That's exactly. We have to engage in the Dawah, the mm. response in the West, to positively respond to the accusations and the and the degradation and the vileness coming from yes. from this video. There's, there's a few text messages I'm gonna, I've still got left to read, brother. You know what's interesting, brother? Everyone yeah. should read the tafsir of Surah Al Kawfar. MashaAllah. That really deals with what the state of the one who hates or, or, or who who assault who who insults the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah says he's up at all. We got a he's break. Inshallah, we'll, we'll discuss back. this later. Inshallah, stay with us. Inshallah, after the break, we'll continue. This, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've come to the uh, last part, last few minutes. I think we're quite tired now. The show normally goes on till about ten o'clock. We've gone so past that time, but Brother Hamza, uh, Jazakallah for coming all the way from London, especially for this. I didn't come from India, I came from London. But still, it's a bit of a mission, man. You must have it's been not a mission, bro. Some brothers drive three hours just to go and eat, or go to a <laughs> well, restaurant, or go to play <laughs> football, or go to watch a football match. If we can't do this for the sake of Allah, defend the Prophet, then, then who are we, man? Subhanallah. I mean, there's nothing, bro. 
We just thank Allah, isn't it? Isn't Alhamdulillah. Allah has given the ability for you and I to be here present it's today to defend. It's a privilege. Allah is blessing us. Sometimes the danger is we, when we do these things, we think we are the source of these things, but we're not. We're just tools Allah uses to manifest His Rahmah, His mercy, guidance. And uh, if we keep on realizing that, then we just know we're just a tool. Oh, oh, what was very intrigued, I was quite intrigued by the way, I, you, I, I speak a lot. People know me, I talk a lot. Yes. And today I've been very, very quiet because you know, I've been intrigued mm-hmm. by the way you've got your stuff together. Mashallah, it's inspiring as well. Oh, no, that's what that we, we do, were able we to deal to in, on, on all fronts, on an intellectual front. Uh, we're able to deal with this, uh, which is, the, is, is pivotal at this moment in time that we get academics in the, uh, we get brothers who are going to really work uh, towards, uh, you know, helping the the dean. I'm um, very professionally, who are highly educated, mashallah. So, you know, it's much less, it's inspiring to sit here and listen to you. Bro, everyone could do this. We're not highly educated. None of us have PhDs. I don't think any of us has a master's either. Uh, Uthman does. Well, with my teachers, of course, <laughs> mashallah, he's a, he's a gem. Mashallah. I'll talk about the brothers in that era. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and and the reason I'm saying this is because you don't need that. Look, Allah is a wajal, the book of the Quran is there to make you think. Mm. You don't need to study to think. Actually, in Western education, they teach you what to think, not how to think. Mm. The Quran teaches you how to think. Subhanallah. Have you not seen the camel and how it was created? And in themselves do they not see? And thus do we explain our signs in detail for those who reflect. Coming from the Arabic triliteral stem. If you go to the classical dictionaries, this implies the thing that you're reflecting upon, inquire about its implications. Don't be a desert romantic just lying on the chair, staring at the sun and touching the sand. Rather, think about the implications of the object of meditation and thought. This is what the Quran is trying to do and tell us to do. And this is very important. And that's why we have to um, read the Quran. Because it, it, it invokes thinking. It makes us think. Alhamdulillah. Just uh, last few text messages and then we're going to tell you, you're washing your eyes. Your eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> you must be very tired, bro. No, yeah, well, I don't know. Is it tired? Maybe it's... Uh, it's a bad habit. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's... Okay. Uh, I, my eyes feel very blurry at the moment for some reason. <laughs> okay. I think I need some milk. I need my milk, bro. I love my full fat milk. Well, I've got some skim milk in the kitchen. No, that's, that's water. <laughs> if you want some, bro. That's I, white water, bro. I can take you for some full fat milk. Uh, I don't know if others do it, but. Okay, this is the last few text messages, and inshallah, we'll go. Assalamu alaikum. We, we must do all we can to remove all con- misconceptions about Islam, especially stemming from the media. We must do all we can to talk about Islam and our Prophet. To others who are clueless about it, violence is not an option. Talking and debating with the people who made the film and the cartoons would be a good start. Yes, yes, that's why we invited them. I even spoke about this on LBC Radio in London, famous radio station with James Whale. And I said, look, we've invited the Channel 4 and Tom Holland to intellectual discussion and we're still waiting for a response. Actually, we've got a response from Tom. He said no, but... We could try. I mean, it needs to have a public discussion because when you make a film, it's so easy. You make all these claims and no one's challenging you. I mean, we did, Aira did write a lengthy response and I've based some of my presentation on that. And you can find it on our website under the press releases. And that website is? Aira.org.uk MashaAllah. Uh, uh, can I read the last text out? Of course you can. Okay, Jazakallah. Uh, very true, Brother Hamza. We in the West have to do dawah about Tom Holland. His film was not thoroughly researched and it was a half hearted attempt at researching the history of Islam. He was not serious about his film but portrayed a negative view. He should accept the debate of about Ayura. Inshallah. Jazakallah, here, brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. But whoever is listening to this show, they should now try and be inspired to now call people to Allah Azza wa Jal. We have this campaign called Don't Shoot the Messenger. If you go to the website testthemessage.com or better, go to iera.org.uk and you will see a front screen which talks about that campaign. Don't Shoot the Messenger. Click on it and you could register. And we want to get 500 du'at in England to come down in the central venue to call people to Allah Azza wa Jal. Via the life of the Prophet And we're going to say look You don't even know who this man is mm. And if you remember in the, begin- in 
the first half of my presentation today, I spoke about a response to the film which claims that the Prophet ﷺ was deluded or he was a liar, he was an imposter. And we, we, we're going to articulate in a positive way just like what we did today. How? How? The Prophet ﷺ was not lying. He was not deluded. He wasn't both lying and deluded. But he was speaking the truth. And this is going to be a way for us to do da'wah. And call people to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because people really need Islam, you know. They, they have an existential crisis. Existential crisis means what? They don't know who they are. They don't know why they are. They don't know whose they are. And they don't know for whom they are. <laughs> they can't answer these questions. They can find I have to go to www.confused.com. <laughs> no, if they go to <laughs> onereason.org, so yes. they can find out as well. Inshallah, that's one of our DAO websites, inshallah. Allah, inshallah. But I want to see people there. I want people to register. I want them to get involved. If you claim to love the Prophet, you claim to want to do da'wah, you claim that you want to defend his honor, then what better way than giving da'wah itself? Because we know the people who attacked the Prophet are already cut off. Allah says in the Quran, Indeed, verily, we have given you the abundance. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice. Indeed, unquestionably, the one who hates you is truly cut off. The one who insults you is cut off. Because we know this chapter came as a result to console the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because the Quraysh was saying that he's cut off because his sons died at early age, and Allah says they are truly cut off. Just before we end the show, brother, uh, this, uh, there was uh, the cartoons that were released in France. Yes, we forgot to quickly mention them. I don't think we need to go in too much detail. No, we don't. But I believe there is a conspiracy. What is your view that all this is happening at uh, relatively the same time? Yeah, of course, it's a, it's a liberal, secular conspiracy. They don't like what the Islamic civilization, Islamic civilization has to advocate. It advocates peace, tolerance, and justice. It talks about that you can speak, but you have to maintain the objectives of speech, which is truth, accountability, and progress and knowledge. But you have to couch your language in a way that's not evil, that's not degrading, that's not insulting, that's harmonious with your human nature. They don't like this. They don't like this alternative paradigm because they like their capitalism, their so-called pseudo-fake kind of geopolitical model that there's too many needs and not enough resources where Allah and His Messenger says that there are enough needs, not enough, there are enough needs, there are limited needs and enough resources, which is substantiated by the Food Agriculture Organization that says there is enough calories on this planet to feed three planets. So they don't like this paradigm because Islam came to change essentially who people worship. But an adherence to an ideology to this extent is also a form of worship because the ulama say there's also the worship of conceptualization, which you can worship a concept. Like communism, or naturalism, or capitalism, and 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 Islam came to free people from the slavery, to enslave themselves to these kind of isms and schisms, and to them for, to bring people back to the true reality. So yes, it's a conspiracy from that perspective, but we have to respond effectively by calling people back to Allah Azza wa Jal. This is very 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 important. But you know what? At the end of the day, the, the people who are doing this, they've lost the argument. They don't have an argument. They don't want to have an intellectual debate and dialogue. And they've shown the state of their civilization is crumbling. And what we have to realize is this, that they are going to face the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they like it or not. If they don't repent, if they don't repent of what they're doing, and they don't come back to Allah azza wa jal, they will face the wrath of Allah. And also... One day a time will come, insha'Allah, where we will have the Khilafah. The Muslims will come together and we'll have, we'll have political unity. And that unity is not to just be an us and them, because the Khilafah is for non-Muslims as well, to protect the Jews and the Christians, just like we did in Islamic Spain and other times, in medieval Baghdad and other places. This is why Jewish historians say nice things about the Muslim history. Zain Zohar, a Jewish historian, he says, Thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. So we're here for everybody. And when we have this power structure that will come back, 
there's going to be a sincere leader, inshallah, according Insha to the Allah. prophetic traditions. And this sincere leader will punish those who degraded the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, obviously in a court of law and with due, due process. But this is something that they have to fear. They're going to have to fear the dunya now and fear the akhirah. But there's a way out, and that way out is the mercy of Allah. And what is the mercy of Allah? Come to His guidance. Don't be a slave to yourself, to society, to the system. And slave yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal. He exists, it's the truth. The Quran is from Him. It's a miracle. As Allah challenged the whole of mankind with regards to produce something like mm. the Quran and no one has and everyone has failed. And also we know the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the aqidah of Islam. It's strong. It has strong roots and therefore it has strong fruits. And it, and it's and the aqidah is true and whatever it comes from truth is truth. So I invite everybody to come to Islam to liberate the souls, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah. Brother, I'm just going to read this last text and then that's it. We finish for the night. Uh, can you please ask Hamza, should we Muslims see this episode as one? We should reject this falsehood so it will not spread. Ignore it as at the moment we are protesting more and more and more people are hearing about this video. Or two, we should see this as a way to show non-Muslims about Islam, our true Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what stance would be best? Wallahu alam, but I think from my limited perspective, the best stance is to do something to show your iman, your love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the best way to do that, brothers and sisters, is to call people back to Allah azza wa jal. This is what the Prophet did. When he was attacked in Mecca, he called them back to Allah. This is what we have to do in the context of the West. We have to protest, be angry, honor the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Defend his honor, but also defend his honor by being someone honorable and by calling people to the beautiful way of Islam. Call people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that we have to understand that we have to have political unity as well. The Muslim lands must unite. We must follow the Quran and the Sunnah to bring peace and justice and tolerance to the whole of mankind like we did before. So on those two counts, make dua for me. Make dua for the ummah. Make dua Amin. for the brothers and sisters Amin. in Syria, in Afghanistan, Amin. in Chechnya, Amin. in Iraq, everywhere where there is oppressed Muslims, that Allah guides them and facilitates their affairs and that they will be dipped in Jannah. And when they're dipped in Jannah, according to the prophetic tradition, they will be asked, did you ever suffer? And they say, wallahi, we've never suffered. Amin. And make dua for the non-Muslims that Allah guides them. Because this is what the prophet did. He didn't want people to, to, to go to hell. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Our, our Joe Blogs, our next door neighbors in Birmingham, they're not the politicians, they're not awliya. Yeah, as the Quran says, they're not the, like the reference points, the political leaders. Mm. They're Joe Blogs. And we to, we have responsibility over them. Definitely. If you read Al Ghazali, for example, he wrote the whole, he wrote based on the, upon the Quran and Sunnah, the rights of the neighbor, including the non Muslim neighbor. And the biggest mm. right is calling them to Islam. Mm. May Allah bless you. Amen. From Brother. me, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Brother Jazakallah for coming all the way down uh, To my listeners inshallah I will be with you next week 9pm uh, Till then Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu